Bud was a city bus driver that wanted nothing more than a 15 minute break like every other city employee. With the help of his union, a year's worth of work, Bud and every bus driver finally got that break that every other employee had. Jane, she was a child support investigator who made two bucks an hour, less than her male colleagues, because she didn't have a college degree, even though she had worked 10 years longer than anybody else. Because Jane finally said, enough's enough. She and others got the wages that they deserved. Never forget a guy named Dave. Dave worked 20 plus years in the Billings landfill. He got passed over for a job promotion because he couldn't read so well. Even though reading had nothing to do with the job that he was seeking. Never forget we went out to lunch halfway through the arbitration and he said to me, lawyer, if I could read so well, I'd be sitting where you are right now. But I put two kids through college working at this trash dump, and I'm damn proud of the work that I've done. Before I entered into public office, I was a union side labor lawyer, representing Teamsters, IBW, our teachers unions, our public employee unions. The stories that you go home and tell your families about both the battles that you win and some that you lose fighting tooth and nail each and every day. Those are the stories my kids grew up listening to. So thanks for the work that you do. For me, those don't weren't just talking points. Spent my career walking that walk as a private citizen, even before I got involved in public office. When our legislature killed a minimum wage increase in 2006, saying, you know what, well then we'd have to lay off a whole bunch of uh, high school students. Notwithstanding the fact that the majority of minimum wage earners are single parent head of households. Formed a group called Raise Montana, increased the minimum wage by ballot initiative, tied it to inflation. As Attorney General, when FedEx Ground classified their drivers as independent contractors, well they set their roots and even told them what logos they had to wear on their socks. I led the national effort of AGs to fight back against worker misclassification. As governor, and with a legislature that's more Republican than yours, we preserved our pension system while maintaining defined benefit. After 20 years of trying, we passed an earned income tax credit. After 20 years of fighting, we finally got presumptive illness coverage for our fi firefighters who face those risks each and every day. We made record investments in our K-12 system, first-time investments in pre-K, froze college tuition, but also recognized not everybody's going to go to college. So we made our two-year colleges and our tribal colleges about apprenticeships, work-based learning so people could climb that ladder to success. More people are climbing in the middle class in Montana than any state in the country. When the U.S. Supreme Court took up cases like Friedrichs and Janus, was the only governor in the country to actually weigh in and side with organized labor. As governor, I've vetoed every single attempt to make Montana right to work for the state. As attorney general and as governor, I've taken on Citizens United and the corrupting influence of money in our system, which actually keeps people from both our economy and Washington, D.C. working for us. We kicked the Koch brothers out of the state of Montana during our elections. If we can do that in Montana, you sure as hell ought to be able to do it in Iowa and all across this country. When a generation of workers have been replaced by independent contractors, and union membership's half of what it was in the 1980s. When there's now twice as many contract workers as there are union members, it's pretty clear that D.C. and our state houses aren't working for working people. When Lindsey Graham literally says, we got to get these tax cuts through to make our donors happy. And 44% of Americans wouldn't have 400 bucks in their pocket in case of emergency. When whoever cleans up tonight actually paid more in taxes than 60 Fortune 500 companies like Chevron, like Amazon, it's clear our economy isn't working for everyone. Look, I get every four years, you have all kinds of folks that come to your state. They tell you that they are going to be your voice and your hope for working people. They introduce 37 point plans, tell you how important you are. They talk the talk, even if they haven't always walked the walk. Then come February next year, bye bye. Caucus is all over, we leave. And you're stuck with inaction in Washington, D.C. when it comes to workers' rights, but also a legislature that has consistently and systematically 
eroded your right to organize and collectively bargain. For decades now, Americans have been playing defense. American workers have been playing defense. Too much of your time and energy is spent fending off attacks on your hard-won victories. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of playing defense. It's time to start playing offense. We need to make sure that every American who works hard has a fair shot at success. And let's be clear about what that means. Should we consider the future of American workers? We have to look forward, not just backwards. When Donald Trump promises us to restore that economy from the 1950s, he is fighting a losing battle. Yeah, we need to fight unfair practices of other countries. We need to make sure that workers aren't the forgotten stepchild when it comes to trade deals. We also need to be investing in workers, wages, retirement systems, making our companies care about their employees, care more about their employees than they do stock buybacks for their shareholders. We can make sure that workers receive an honest day's wage for an honest day's work. Increasing the minimum wage doesn't just impact the lowest paid workers, it actually goes all the way up the food chain. We also have to recognize that just having a job isn't enough. We need to expand health care. We need to make it affordable. And we can do that by a public option, by negotiating prescription drug prices, by ending surprise medical billing and out-of-network charges, not by taking away the employer-sponsored health care of 165 million people and requiring us all to pay more in taxes. The expansion of health care, the biggest expansion of health care, since Medicare was Obamacare. Republicans have tried 70 times now to repeal it. Now Democrats are often wanting to do the same and starting all over. From my perspective, that's not the best policy to get us to affordable and accessible health care. It's also not the best politics if we want to win next fall. One of the most important partners in all of these fights have to be each and every one of you. I'll certainly fight for an employee Free Choice Act. I'll push for sectoral bargaining, work to expand the list of mandatory subjects of bargaining. We have laws on the books. Some of them are pretty damn good, we just don't have enforcement. We don't have an LRB that actually works for workers anymore. We have to go after employers who pay women workers less than their male counterparts. We have to hire actually the inspectors and give them the teeth to ensure wages are paid and workplaces are safe. And together, we can do more. But first things first, our challenge next November is to defeat a president who said to workers he'd have your back, then embraced one of the most anti-worker agendas in 80 years, an agenda that prioritizes special interests over workers' interests, an agenda that leads and widens in income inequality levels never seen in my time. To defeat that president, we have to be able to do more than just go to those patches of blue. We have to win back places that we lost. It won't be easy, but I know that we can do it. In 2016, I was the only Democrat in the country to win in a statewide re-elect in a state where Trump won. He took Montana by 20. I won by four. 25 to 30 percent of my voters voted for Donald Trump. The path to victory doesn't just run through the coasts. It runs through places like right here in Iowa. Think about what's happened to your state. A third of your counties win Obama, Obama, Trump. We have to have someone at the top of the ticket that can not only win the White House, but can help you take back your state house. I know that you're skeptical. <laughs> you're skeptical of people coming, making big promises. So here's what I'll promise you. If I'm the nominee, I'm going to carry Vermont, Massachusetts, and California. Make sure to ask those senators if they can carry places like Montana, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Iowa, because that's how we win this election. Look, I'm a pro-choice, pro-union, populist Democrat who's won three times in a red state, not by compromising our values, but by bringing people together and fighting like hell to get results. Folks aren't asking for government to give them anything or everything. What they're asking for is for a fair shot. I'm running because I know that we could win back places that we lost, bring people together, beat Donald Trump, and make this economy and democracy work for every single person in this country. 155 days from today, I don't care what everything else says, you're the ones that decide how to take a field of 37 down a lot further. Hope you look at SteveBullock.com. I hope you follow me all along. Thanks so much for having me today.